after the first gospel is declared by God in the context of a curse to the serpent in Genesis 3.15, the woman is addressed. Now, even though the woman will be the instrument of salvation for the world, there will be abiding consequences of sin which accrue specifically to the woman. In other words, there are ways that a woman suffers which a man does not suffer, which are the specific result of the woman's role in the first sin. I can only think that childbirth as originally conceived by God would have been a wonderful thing, all blessing, no pain, no inconvenience, no difficulty. It's very hard for us in the 21st century in the state of modern medicine to understand how dangerous it has always been in previous centuries for a woman to have a baby. How high the incidence of maternal mortality was in the world. It's still the case that it's a very painful and difficult thing for a woman to have a baby. It's still the case that because a woman has a body designed to give birth, there are realities that take place in her body, at least monthly, which are uncomfortable and which are inconvenient and which constitutes a difficulty and a discomfort which a woman has to endure, which a man does not have to endure. God says, I will multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children. Now the next phrase is mysterious. And the next phrase is interpreted in different ways by Bible-believing scholars. I'm going to give you one interpretation that I like best. Am I absolutely sure that this is what it means and this is the only thing that it means? No, I'm not. I'm just telling you that this is the interpretation that I like best. God says, childbirth is going to be painful for you. It's going to be really painful. But then he says, yet your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Now, here's the question. When God says, your desire shall be for your husband, is that connected to what he says before when he talks about the pain in childbirth? Or is that connected to what he says after when he says, yet your husband shall rule over you? I think it's connected to what is said before. Here's the idea. Because childbirth is so painful for a woman, because childbirth is so potentially dangerous for a woman, does that mean that a woman is not going to want to have anything to do with the relationship which leads to childbirth? No, that's not what it means. I believe that what God is saying is that even though childbirth is difficult or dangerous, you will still desire your husband. You will still want that relationship which leads to childbirth. Another possibility, I think that's the true interpretation. The other possibility is that the phrase is connected with what follows and that what God is saying is, you know, you're going to want to be the boss, you're going to want to rule over your husband, but the fact is your husband is going to rule over you. I don't think that's what it means. When the scripture says that he shall rule over you, does this mean that the role that the woman has to play in marriage in terms of the man's leadership does this mean 
that that role would not have been necessary before the fall. Well, let me say this. The fact that the man was created first and the fact that the man is the head in the sense of the leader of the woman in marriage, not necessarily in life, but in marriage, this was a reality before the fall. I think what the fall meant was, but now that's going to be hard. I think before the fall, a woman would always delight in that role, but it's much harder now because of the fall for a woman to delight in that role. Okay, now obviously this is a big, big conversation that we could talk about a long time, but we're almost at the end of the second day and we're not even at the end of the third chapter, so we can't linger over these intriguing um, subjects, even though it is very, very intriguing. God says to Adam in verse 17, because you've listened to the voice of your woman and have eaten from the fruit of the tree, the ground will be cursed because of you. Now, let me just say that, remember Adam is the Lord of creation. And Adam was the head. Adam was created first. Adam was given the warning about the tree of knowledge. This is why we don't fall in Eve. The world did not fall when Eve took the fruit because Eve is not the head. The world fell and we fell with it when Adam ate the fruit. Okay, I told you I would mention this. This is also one reason, and I don't understand all of this mystery, okay? I don't understand why it has to be this way, but it is. Um, the sin nature that we have as human beings, we do not inherit from Eve. We inherit from Adam. Okay, we are, we are making theological conclusions from that, and we are inferring this. We get our sin nature from the male. We get our sin nature from our father. Now, we have to ask the question, why did Christ not have a human father? Occasionally, I mean, obviously, no unbeliever believes that. And even people who say that they're believers believe that Jesus had a human father and they do not deny, they do not believe the virgin birth. Occasionally we get these crazy fantasies which unbelievers make a bunch of money off of. Four years ago we had an example of this in, in a novel written by Dan Brown. And in the novel he suggests, called The Da Vinci Code. And in the novel, he suggests that our Lord Jesus Christ was actually married to Mary Magdalene. The Mormons also teach that Christ married Mary and Martha, the other Mary of Bethany. And, and we have these, these ideas which are suggested or by novelists or even taught as doctrine by people who, who believe unbiblical religions. We ask the question, was Christ married? Of course he was not married. Then we ask the question, why didn't Christ marry? Well, there could be lots of answers to that. Let me give you one answer. Because he was already engaged. He was engaged to the church. Now I only mention that, which is a little bit off the subject to mention this. Why did Christ not have a human father? Because he already had a father. He didn't need another father because he already had a father. But there's another reason. Our sin nature is inherited, is communicated to us, is received by us through our fathers, 
through the male agency in our conception. Christ had no male agency in His conception. He was conceived not by a human father, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. He received 100% of His human nature from His mother, which is a tremendous compliment to the woman. But Christ was born without original sin. The doctrine of original sin means, and we learn about it in Romans 5, 12 through 21, and again, there's mystery here. The doctrine of original sin is that when Adam sinned, you sinned, and I sinned. Not when Eve sinned, but when Adam sinned. In some way, you and I have a solidarity with Adam. Some people teach that it's just representative, like if, if Barack Obama is my president, if Barack Obama says I'm at war with North Korea, I'm at war with North Korea because he is my federal head. And some people believe that Adam was our federal head, that if Adam sinned, we sin because he is our head by representation. I personally take a minority view among Christians, and I believe it's more than that. I believe in a way that we cannot fully understand that you and I actually participated in the sin in a way that brought real guilt on us. I, I don't have time to talk about the reason that I make that argument. Part of it has to do with an argument that is made in the book of Hebrews about Melchizedek and Aaron. But I don't have time to go into it now. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. But let me just say that when Adam sinned, you and I received not only a sin nature, but you and I experienced real guilt. Now, if we think that's not fair, this is, this is called the doctrine of imputation. Imputation is like writing a check. If I write a check from my bank, let's say, let's say I write a check to Igor and he cashes it. Here's what that means. It means that the money is taken out of my bank and is imputed to his account in his bank. There are three imputations in the Bible. There's the imputation of our guilt to Christ on the cross. We say, wonderful, great, that's a wonderful idea. There's the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us by faith. We say, hallelujah, that's great, we like that. And there's the imputation of Adam's sin to us. We say, wait a minute, that's not fair. Wait a minute, that's not fair. See, we have no problem with the imputation when we benefit. But we have a problem with it if we feel like, hey, I shouldn't be blamed for that. Well, that's one reason I believe that we participated in a way that we can't quite understand. But it would take a long time for me to talk about that. And a majority of theologians believe that we need nothing more than the federal representation of Adam. He's not only the head of the human race, he's the head of the human government. If he says we're at war with God, we're at war with God because we sinned against God. Like if your president says you're at war with some other country, then you're at war with that country. I think it's more than that. I don't think that's enough. But again, theologians disagree. Well, the ground is cursed. Adam is the Lord of the ground, and because he sins, there are consequences in the ground. And again, the curse is not, now you got to work, but the curse is, you're not always going to get full pay for your work. You may work for 12 hours one day, and you may get a lot of food from that 12 hours of work. You may work 15 hours another day and get no food. Futility. You know what futility is? That's when we 
it doesn't do any good. We study, study, study for the exam, but we still make a bad grade. What does that mean? It means our study was futile. It didn't do any good. We till the ground, we plant the seed, we water it, we do everything we can, but the harvest is not a good harvest. What does that mean? It means our work was futile, it was wasted. That's what was brought on by the curse. That's what was brought on by the fall. Not work, but the fact that we're not always fully rewarded for our work. That's what's happening in Genesis 3. Now, I showed you this in the John course, and I'm going to show you this in the Genesis course, because the two places where we find this are the book of John and the book of Genesis. So, not everybody who heard the John teaching will hear the Genesis teaching. So, if you heard this teaching before, then I'm sorry I'm repeating it. But I'm repeating it for those who haven't heard it. Notice what happens in verse 18. Another thing that happens because of the fall is that not only good things come out of the ground, but now bad things also come out of the ground. Now the ground is going to give us thorns and thistles. Evidently in the Garden of Eden there were only roses, there weren't thorns. Now we're going to get bad things out of the ground. Um, and again, there's the mention of death in verse 19. Well, verse 19 says work's going to be hard now. Work was probably always delightful before, but now sometimes work is still delightful, isn't it? Depends on what kind of work we do. But now work is going to be also be hard, and we're going to have to sweat it out. And one day we're going to die. We're going to return to the dust. All that happened because of the fall.